we were heading out to California. We, we basically like took six months off and traveled all over national parks, me and my buddy. And we were just camping out like the entire time. So th- there was a few strange things that happened. There was a few strange things that happened. We get out to Death Valley. I don't know if you're familiar with like the Panamint Mountains out in Death Valley. Supposedly that's where they found these like giants and some caves out there. There's like a bunch of caves out there and there's, you know, there's all kinds of stories about the, the giants that they found there. Um, very remote, inaccessible. And so I was camping out in Panamint Valley, like it was my favorite place out there. So I had camped out there a bunch. But this particular night, like heard this crazy, like gorilla sound way from way up in the mountains. It was just like, ooh, 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 kind of thing. But it was like so loud. The sound filled up the entire valley. It, it sounded like maybe it could have been two people. But then I was like, wait, that's coming from like way up in those mountains. There is little chance that anyone's up there doing that at like two in the morning. The scale of that place is so massive. Like, I don't even think if you were a person with a normal lung capacity, you could even reverberate like that. And it went on for hours. I was like, damn, that's Bigfoot. It was strange. Never heard anything like that before or since. But all I can just, all I can say is it sounded like a gorilla, like a stereotypical gorilla. I'd like to welcome Brian to Bigfoot Crossroads. Brian emailed me a while back. A really interesting story. Brian, thanks for coming on. Good to talk to you. Hey, thank you. It's great to be here. Yeah, let's just get right into it. If you don't mind, like you did in the email, just walk us through what happened. All right. Uh, So in the email, I was basically talking about the Bigfoot stuff, and uh, but there's also some uh, other like, I don't know if you would want to call it alien or just some other weird stuff that happened. So I'll, I'll keep the two separate. Okay. Yeah, and if we have time, I can go into the, the alien stuff. Oh, uh, we'll make time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. Um, but yeah, so this all started, well, I guess, uh, back in Maine, um, I was, uh, kind of at a crossroads in life, you might say, pun intended, and um, was basically doing this job on the Outer Banks of North Carolina and decided I wanted to uh, go up to New England, had some family up there, and um, just, like, figure out the next move. So this was, like, the winter of 2005 and uh, or, like, maybe, you know, slash 2006. Yeah. And so I get up there and I'm like, what do I want to do? And I'm like, hmm, maybe I'll just go study herbal medicine. That sounds fun. Um, so, cause I had kind of been into that for a while and I was like, this was like right at the start of the internet. And, uh, I guess, you know, around there, but I ended up finding this uh, lady that does herbal medicine out in rural Maine. And, uh, I was like, all right, this looks cool. And my, my, uh, aunt and uncle thought I was kind of crazy, but I was like, I'm just going to go check this lady out. And this was like April. Um, no, wait, this was March. I think I I stayed up there for a little while in this. And then in March, I decided I was going to go over there. And so it's still like cold and, you know, I didn't know what I was getting into. Didn't have a cell phone or, um, I don't think she had answered her phone. And, uh, so I just decided to just go out there, end up getting out there late at night. And basically no one was there. It was just completely dark. And, uh, I had had a hard time finding the place cause we found out later the snowplow had taken out the mailbox that winter. But, uh, so I get there and, um, I see a little fire pit. So I'm just like, you know, start a fire and I'm like playing some guitar by the fire. And I don't know, it's probably like nine or 10 o'clock at night, maybe later. And right at, right. Like right when I start playing guitar, uh, I hear this like ridiculous, crazy 
scream coming from the wood line because there was like a big field and then the wood line uh was probably like i don't know a quarter mile away and then it just goes off in the woods for forever and uh yeah i heard this like crazy scream and it sounded like how i how best i could put it is it sounded like a mechanical wolf okay yeah it was it was just like had this mechanical kind of sound to it but it was it it sounded like a wolf howl and um but also like a scream and i had never heard anything like that before like heard a bunch of coyotes in in vermont and you know potentially some other Maybe like there's some wolves around there. I don't know, but I've heard some, you know, all those animals and this was nothing like that. And, uh, you know, there's like moose up there and stuff like that. Definitely not that. And you haven't even like talked to the lady at this point. You're just out there by yourself. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I (laughs) I didn't tell her I was coming. Uh, yeah. So nobody was there and I was just like, all right, well, I'm just going to stay here. And, uh, apparently she had, she goes to Italy for the winters and, uh, I didn't know that. So nobody was going to be around there for a while. And yeah, so I don't know, man, I don't know what that was, but I, I got freaked out and I just jumped in my van and stayed there the rest of the night. It was freaky. It was a freaky. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I would say so. Just, uh. You're, yeah, you're brave for just doing that <laughs> to begin with, but then like, right, <laughs> stupid. You hear that and you don't really know where you are or anything, just by yourself. Like, all right, we're in it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's getting real. Uh, so yeah, I just go to sleep, and then the next morning, um, I was like going out to fix that mailbox, so I found this old like cedar pole or whatever and put up the mailbox and then the neighbors come over and they're like what are you doing over here and i was like oh i was just gonna meet this lady and they were like yeah she's not coming back here for like another month so long story short i end up meeting this neighbor organic dairy farmer and uh he takes me kind of like under his wing and teaches me all about like organic uh methods for treating cattle and i was living on a shed out on his land for like a month until she came back and that was really cool. And then when she came back, um, she accepted me as a apprentice for the year. And uh, so this was about like maybe April, May when I when she came back and, and I moved over there and uh, met this girl, uh, Rach. And we were we kind of became like fast friends and we started exploring all over the property, looking for herbs. And I had basically forgotten about the screen thing like nothing ha- happened out at uh guys dairy farm or anything like that and i would basically just like walk around at night like you know with all the cows and <laughs> nothing else weird happened um so but anyway so we're we're walking around exploring that day probably like the next like the day after i got there or something and uh came out to the middle of nowhere and there was this big clearing out in the, in the woods, just like this big clearing. And right in the middle of the clearing was this old stone circle, probably about like 10 foot in diameter. Yeah. <laughs> kind of weird. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, I don't think that the, the lady knew about this. It wasn't like on her property. It was like off her property uh, on this, like this neighbor's property. And there wasn't any trails to get out to this place. I mean, I don't know, you know. Maybe she was into some witchcraft stuff, or maybe this was like a old pagan thing from like way before, or maybe it was like a Native American thing. I have no idea, but I know that the the stone circles is a big thing in in like a pagan culture, mm-hmm. I guess, and it's associated with like fairies and like you don't want to go into the fairy ring kind of thing. And uh, so, like, we were just kind of goofing off and like jumping around all in the all in the fairy ring, I guess you might say. And, you know, not really thinking anything of it. And then later that night, probably about dusk, um, we were just hanging out in the herb house is what we called it. It was like this old dilapidated structure. <laughs> and uh, basically I was like going to walk out to my van to get some tobacco. 
and walking from the herb house to my van, there's like no lights. Um, I don't even think I had my headlamp on. I don't even know if I had a headlamp. It was just, it wasn't super dark, but it wasn't. Yeah. I knew where the, there was like a big trail through the tall grass. So you could, you could get there pretty easily. And as I'm coming back from that, there's like this thing. It was like, it looked like a tree stump in the trail or like right off the side of the trail. And it was, I, I just like stopped and I was like, Hmm, I don't remember that. That's weird. And I'm just like stopping and looking at this thing. And then right then it just like stands up and then it starts like hobbling over to me like really fast, like coming towards you. Yeah. Yeah. I just definitely got the, the, the hair rising on my, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it came right for me. And the weird thing about it was, well, I mean, that, if that's not weird enough, it had like this, like a limp. Um, and the lady, the, the medicine lady, you know, she walked with a limp because she had polio when she was a kid. And this thing walked kind of like how she was walking. But she didn't move like this fast. <laughs> and like she wasn't, yeah. So I don't think it was her like playing a joke on. She wasn't like that. Um, but it was about her height and it walked kind of like her. And my first impression was like, or after I thought about it a little bit, you know, um, I was like, damn, it seemed like it was mimicking how she walked whatever that thing was. Yeah. Um, but of note, when it stood up, it just like stood straight up from a crouch position. Like I've heard like Bigfoot do. Mm -hmm. Um, it just stood straight up. Like it didn't use its hands or anything. It just went boop, like straight up. I mean, was it like covered in hair and all that? So, yeah, um, it was like pretty dark, but I kind of just, I kind of just saw the outline of it. Um, but it was like completely black, whatever it was. And it was like definitely like covered in some hair or, you know, uh, I'll, I'll get into what else it could have been in a second, but like, yeah, it was definitely covered in some kind of hair. And yeah, unfortunately, like I was just so shocked by it and it happened so fast that I didn't really get a good look at it. Um, because it was kind of, you know, like I said, it was pretty dark too. So I mean, you said it was like coming towards you. So, like, how close did it get? Did it eventually like turn and run off, or what happened? I turned and ran off. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, no, it was like it seemed like okay. So when I first saw it, it was probably like twenty feet away. Uh -huh. And then when it when I turned to run off, it was like almost right next to me. Wow! Like if I had if I hadn't moved, it would have grabbed me or, you know, pushed me. I don't know what it was going to do. Um, but it seemed like it was pissed off. And I always thought it was because we were playing around in that fairy circle. And that was like the same day. Yeah, that was the same day. Wow. And then when I came in and told her about it, she'd like turn white as a ghost. And she, and even today when I tell her about that, like she does not want to talk about it. Really? Ever. Yeah. So like whatever, I don't know if she saw something or whatever, but it freaked her out probably more than it freaked me out. Um, and I was pretty freaked out, <laughs> <laughs> but like we were camping outside, you know, like, so maybe that's why she didn't want to talk about it. Cause, uh, yeah, I don't know, but it was just weird. I don't know what that was, but the way how it moved and how fast it was, there is no way that it was that old lady. She had to walk around with a cane. So anyone thinking that it was definitely not that. So what else is going to be out? I mean, yeah, I mean, it could, can't, can't just say it wasn't a person obviously, but you know, it just, I didn't get that vibe at all. I mean, people usually talk to one another. They don't just like stand up and start coming at you. It was almost like it was, I saw it because it was like trying to crouch there. Like, I don't know, maybe it was going to ambush me or whatever but like when it stood up and started running towards me it was like oh you saw me like so yeah, i don't know dude <laughs> and was it like on the trail itself no it was uh it was kind of like in the grass off to the side a little bit um but it was definitely like close to the trail it was definitely close to the trail and it was definitely like facing the trail 
Yeah, that's so weird, especially the way that you're describing how it walked. You know, I whenever I was younger, I I knew some older adults that both had polio whenever they were younger. So I know that walk that you're talking about. Yeah. And it is kind of uh, almost like, I hate to say it, but kind of like an orangutan walking on two legs, kind of like that rocking side yeah. to side as they walk. Kind of like that, yeah. Yeah, that's so weird, though. I mean, did you experience any other strange things besides the scream and that while you were there? Yeah, so... I alluded to that. Uh, that was going to mention what else it could have been if it wasn't covered with fur. Yeah. And so, a couple of days later, we were uh, having lunch out on the porch, and uh, her partner, this cool old guy Jack, who has since you know he passed on a couple maybe like a year after this or something, but um, we were just sitting there having lunch, and he just like looks up, and then he just like looks back down, and he's like, "I just saw." Uh, <laughs> I don't remember exactly what he said, but he's like, he just saw like this black creature walking down this little trail, like off close to the wood line. And he said it was wearing a black skunk cape with like a little pointy hat. And I'm like, what? Cause I hadn't told him about, I hadn't told, I don't know why, but I didn't tell them about seeing that thing. Um, a couple of days before, but yeah, he was like, yeah, I saw that. And I was like, well, what do you think that was? And he was like, I don't know. <laughs> so there's that. So I always called it the skunk gnome. And I was thinking like, well, maybe that was like a gnome or something. Cause there's like gnome mythology up in that area. And they, they're purported to be like kind of, you know, malevolent and protective of stuff. Yeah. How, how tall did he say it was? Probably like four or five feet, maybe maybe less than that. But it wasn't. It was definitely like not an av- like a average person size. It was short, and it was wearing like a a skunk pelt type cape. Yeah, he saw it walking away, so he didn't see it from the front. Mm-hmm. But it was wearing long black like cape or whatever, and it had like skunk stripes down the middle of it. And then like a black kind of like little pointy hat. That's just so crazy. <laughs> I mean, like, what is that? What do you do with that? I mean, like, cause you also found like the big stone ring out in the woods, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And then you have your experience. And then this guy, uh, who I think you, maybe I'm mistaken, but it seems like in the email you were talking about kind of like, he's not the type that would just like, come up with a crazy story like this uh no uh, i mean he was a little eccentric yeah. you know but like he was like a really great guy like you know he wasn't out there trying to fool people or do crazy shenanigans like that and it just like lined up so perfectly with what i've seen and the strange stuff that had been going on there that past couple of days and even that month before there was that weird scream and why would he he didn't know any of that stuff like why would he just come up with that out of the blue so in Oklahoma, I've definitely heard, you know, stories about uh, what the Native Americans called little people. Um, yes. But, I mean, those are like nowhere near that size. Right, right. Yeah, I've heard some stories about California and stuff. And they're like real short. Yeah. Like real little. I mean, I'm trying to think of anything. Uh, <laughs> in my Rolodex of crazy information, and uh, I can't, I don't, I've never heard about anything like that. I don't know what that was. Yeah, I mean, I like I said, I just think it. I, I don't know what it was. Maybe it's two different things. Maybe it was like, you know, maybe I saw like a Bigfoot that one night. Maybe I saw he saw the a gnome creature. <laughs> but for some reason, I kind of think the two are connected, and. Uh, so, like, apologies. I know this is Bigfoot Crossroads, but maybe this is a gnome story, but I'm not really sure. <laughs> no. <laughs> the Crossroads part means everything. If anybody def- listening has any idea what that could have been, you know, 
shoot me a message or an email or something because I'd love to hear it because, I mean, I've never, I mean, wearing the animal skins and all that, I just think there was something going on there. And I don't know if it was, you know, necessarily tied to it, but it's also interesting where you were, you know, it's kind of like a medicine woman, basically, you know? Right, right. Which you would think would be very in tune with nature and the property and everything and things there yeah. might be uh, more willing to present themselves, if that makes sense. Yep. And also she had like gardens full of like food and, med- you know, herbs and stuff. Yeah. But yeah, totally. And she's not there, half, you know, for the, like half a year. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's it sounds like a perfect place for them to come uh, people watch and all sorts of things. I mean, geez, I don't even know what to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> Me neither. And I'd be interested if anyone has any information on that, because, you know, it's just been some I've always wondered about. Yeah. That's kind of why I wanted to come on here just to get it out there. Would you mind uh, talking about your adventures in California? Yeah, man. So that's right after this uh, uh, on my little timeline. So after that, um, there was some other really weird stuff that happened in Maine, but that's more on the alien segment. So what, so jump into California. Um, basically, like spring 2008, or no, winter uh, 2008, um, and I don't know why I was traveling like March, but this was, we left in March and we were heading out to California and, um, we, we basically like took six months off and, and like just traveled all over national parks, me and my buddy. And we were just camping out like the entire time. And, uh, it was, it was like the, the coolest, funnest trip ever. And, but you know, there was a few strange things that happened. There was a few strange things that happened. Um, which reminds me, I forgot to put something in my little alien timeline. But uh, but yeah, we get out to Death Valley. And um, I don't know if you're familiar with like the Panamint Mountains out in Death Valley. But um, supposedly that's where they found these like giants in some caves out there. There's like a bunch of caves out there. And there's, you know, there's all kinds of stories about uh, the giants that they found there. Okay. Yeah. Painting in mountains, um, very remote, inaccessible. And, uh, so this is just a real quick story. It, it's, <laughs> you know, you can edit it out if you want, but, um, it was like, I was camping. I would drop my friend off. He would go camping back like remote, uh, for like two weeks. And so I would just kind of bop around in, in the car. And so I was camping out in Panama Valley. Like it was my favorite place out there. And so I had camped out there a bunch, but this particular night, like heard this crazy, like gorilla sound way from way up in the mountains. And it was, it was just like, ooh, 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 kind of thing. But it was like so loud because it, 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 the, the sound, um, filled up the entire valley. And at first I thought it was like, oh, dude. Well, I'm not even going to say what I thought it was, but it, it it sounded like maybe it could have been two people. Um, but then I was like, wait, that's coming from like way up in those mountains. And there is, there is little chance that anyone's up there like doing that at like two in the morning. And I don't even think if you, the scale of that place is so massive. Like, I don't even think if you were a person with a normal lung capacity, you could even reverberate like that. Um, so that was just a weird little thing. Yeah. I mean, and this is in Death Valley? Yeah, it was in Death Valley. And it went on for hours. And, um, and yeah, that was like, I was like, damn, that's Bigfoot. It was strange. And um, never heard anything like that before or since. But all I can, just, all I can say is it sounded like a gorilla. Like a stereotypical gorilla. And completely different than the sound you heard in Maine. Oh, completely different. The one in Maine was more like the uh, uh, alarm sound, or what do you call that? Yeah, the siren call. Yeah, yeah. It was kind of like that, but also like not quite like that. I've heard that siren call out in, in California, too. Okay, let's just get let's just jump to that. So, 
I was out and uh, ended up on this farm in California, cannabis farm. And uh, I, my little brother graduated in like high school, like 2008, I think. Yeah, so it was that summer. Um, and so I took off to go see his graduation. And like I have a thing about flying, so I rode the Greyhound bus across country to Virginia. Don't recommend that. It, I didn't. <laughs> that would be a, so late. a fun trip. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's a whole other story. But it was like so late. I was so late. I, even, I ended up missing his graduation because they're just like never on time. And uh, when I got back to California, um, I got dropped off at like 2 a.m. in Redding and uh, had to like hitchhike back to, you know, where I was up in the near the like, Trinity Alps. And then I had to walk like 10 or plus miles back to this remote place we were at. And it was actually the night when I was walking back of the 2008 lightning storms that caused the massive fires in 2008 out there. And it was like just hell on earth the whole summer. But uh, this was the night when all the lightning was striking everywhere. And it was intense. Like you're walking out in the back country and there's just like lightning going off everywhere. But it, you know, so there was just like unrest in the air. There was just a bunch of unrest going on. And when I get out to this, this bit about the halfway marker of that walk, there's like this huge ranch and like the uh, elk come down there and my, and migrate down there all every winter. And there's just like herds of elk out there. And, um, So I I'm walking through this giant, you know, farm or like ranch. And all of a sudden I hear that, that, uh, that siren call. I hear that. And I'm like, Hmm, do they got a, you know, a siren? Is there like a fire from lightning or something? That was my first thought. And I was like, they don't have no siren. Like this is like this remote ranch in the middle of like Northern California, like in the middle of nowhere. Like, and then I heard it again and it was closer and I was like, Oh shit, I know what that is. And instantly, right, right when it dawned on me, what I was hearing, the entire herd of elk was, was, uh, stampeding. The entire herd of elk was stampeding. It was like, I don't know, a hundred of them, maybe less. Wow. And they were literally coming right towards me. And there was like a, uh, barbed wire because I'm on the road and, and the, the migration route is from the field back to these woods across the road. Um, and you would always see them jumping over the barbed wire. It's just like driving to town. You know, you always see the elk out there. They're always like jumping over the fence. I always saw that so many times. And this is like a five foot tall barbed wire fence. And they would just like jump over it like it was nothing, you know. And uh, but yeah, never had been in like a elk stampede before. <laughs> so I basically I basically just had to like curl in the fetal position and like pray. And these things were jump literally jumping over me. Wow. And elk are like freaking huge, man. Huge. Absolutely ridiculous. Like Ford expeditions, like jumping over a fence. Yeah. And this was at like two o'clock in the morning. You said. Yeah. Yeah. I mean that, that would have been terrifying. (laughs) It was so dumb <laughs> i was like why am i here um, and it was like right when i walked through is when that alarm went off yeah. and so it's whatever that was or whatever that was had seen me and i always thought that you know that's why they were yelling because they thought i was trying to like hunt some elk or something and i was like no nah, i'm passing through <laughs> that's an interesting theory i mean elk stampede Lightning storm, <laughs> Bigfoot siren call. Yeah, that would, I mean, I'm just trying to put myself in that position. That would have been so crazy to experience. It was crazy. And the crazy thing was, only thing I had for light was a old, like a cheap, not even a good, but like a cheap lighter. <laughs> so I started lighting the lighter because it wasn't like raining at this point. It was just, it was like dry lightning. Yeah. And I was just lighting the lighter. I'm like, you know. You don't want any of this. Like, <laughs> just started running, man. And I just like ran away from that 
whole situation and just like right when I got back in the woods, it all calmed back down. Didn't have any more problems. And finished my walk and, you know, passed out. Did you talk to anybody about the calls or anything? Did you hear any, like, did anybody else experience anything from the cannabis farm or whatever? Oh, no, that was like five or six miles away. Oh. Uh, yeah, I was like, I had to walk from the highway back to the farm. And so it was a, it was a good trek. Um, yeah. So this was like, yeah, no, no one, I, no, never even really told anybody about, anybody, about anybody about it. Just like, I don't know. I'm like, what do you, <laughs> who's going to believe that? Yeah. You know? And I mean, what are you going to tell them? <laughs> you know, like, Hey, I, I heard this, uh, well, a Bigfoot. <laughs> 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 yeah i got it a her elk stampede and then uh and then so when i was out on that farm i started having all these dreams i started having all these dreams of bigfoot and it was like one of the dreams was like i was in the middle of this field and, and my van was there and they all started like coming and circling me and i just like jumped up on the van and just like we were just looking at each other and i just i don't know what what that was about because like I had never had anything like that before, but I just feel like now looking back, it was because I was starting to come into their territory and I was starting to like, they were starting to notice me maybe. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. But yeah, I don't know if they were like, if that was actually real or if it was just a, a fragment or, a, you know, because of that experience. And I thought I had heard Bigfoot out there and in death Valley and the thing in Maine, maybe it was just my mind doing tricks or maybe it was something that was actually happening, but, uh, started having those experiences. And then, um, pretty much after that, I moved up to this other farm. Well, it was more of like a, a big property and I turned it into my own little, uh, farm up there in the mountains. And, um, that's when the next thing happened up there. So, it, this was like a 400 acre uh, piece of property surrounded by nothing just, you know, for miles, miles and miles, just nothing out there, but it was pretty close to the, to the farm down there. I had just come from and uh, we were pretty much like um, me and this, this buddy I met up there. Um, we were starting our own little farm and to get up there to this place where you had sunlight, you had to go straight up this like, ridiculous little foothill and um out back east we call that a mountain but out there it was just like a foothill and it was it was just like no rocks or anything just like this big clay you know mountain kind of thing and so we were just going straight up this thing with the, with the uh, quad and basically just like cut a road right up this thing and i mean it was steep and um like you would, you'd be going up that and you feel like the quad was about to turn. It actually, we actually did flip it a few times, but, um, ended up getting up there and clearing out this, this big area for, for our farm. And, um, so pretty much like the, the day after we started cutting this road, like, um, I was, I, I was walking up there the next morning or something like that. And, uh, this big old rock comes hurtling down the road. And it was like, it was like a two foot diameter, kind of maybe three foot, uh, but kind of flat um, rock. It was like kind of rectangular shape. Um, or, I mean, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't like a perfect circle, but somehow this thing was just coming down like a bowling ball and real fast. And uh, it, it, it came within like a foot of me as I'm walking, as of right when I'm turning to walk up this, this new road we had just cut. And, uh, it just like hurtled past me and just like crashed through the, the woods below. And I was like, okay, that was unexpected because like, there's no, there's no rocks up there. You know, we had cleared all this, all this land up there. And it's like, if you know, like East coast mountains, it's just like, it's, it's kind of rare to find a rock until you get like way up there and then to be like some some little spires sticking out from the ancient, you know, mountains or whatever, but mostly it's just like sediment and clay. 
and that's what this was but there was no rocks even at the top of this thing there was just it was just a rounded clay hill because i would you know we dug down there like 10 20 feet down into this clay and it was just the easiest digging you ever you ever did see and uh you know just just no rocks anywhere and so the thing about this rock was it was like uh it was like a river stone so there was like a creek and a river you know down that right through her property and then there was a big creek down at the bottom but all those rocks had uh, calcification on them from the alkaline water in the creeks and then the river or like the yeah i guess you would call it a creek but it was pretty much like a giant creek down below would have these the river rocks that that's that's probably where this came from because it was like the the ones from the creek up above were like calcified you know and this, this was just like perfectly smooth and you know right from the river and so it seemed, you know, geologically, that rock came from from a river at some point in time. When when it got up there, I have no idea. Um, but yeah, it, it was just very odd. Uh, yeah, it doesn't match the type of rocks uh, in the creek above. Matches the ones at the creek at the bottom, but it's at the top rolling down. Mm-hmm. And and how does a rock that shape? just start rolling down a hill like that true true yeah i don't i know right <laughs> you didn't like see anything or hear anything other than the rock nothing and i right after that happened i just instantly walked up there to like try to make sense of it and like there was nothing up there like i mean there was there could have been something up there you're in you're in manzanita scrub i mean this thick up there so it could have been it could have been somewhat there, but I didn't hear or see anything. And uh yeah, I mean it was it was like some telling me to, to not be up there. And I know what people will say is like, you know, you just cleared all that road. Uh it could have just been a loose rock that came loose, yeah, right at that exact time. And then like you just said, how would it even start rolling? Like nothing nothing else came down. There wasn't any landslide anywhere on that entire road. There was just that one rock. Yeah, and you could also look at it from the perspective of you did just clear that road. <laughs> and so that might have pissed somebody off, you know? Yeah, that's what I think. That's what I think. Um, because there was other weird stuff up there, too. Like, there was a... a you familiar with Manzanita? Not at all. Not at all. Well, it's like this really awesome little tree. Um, that's like a bush that grows all over Northern California on the South facing slopes. And, um, it's like, just like this really hard wood. And, um, but it, it kind of has, it kind of has these like shallow roots, but I mean, I wouldn't say they're easy to pull out, but you know, yeah, I definitely wouldn't say they're easy to pull out. And so there was a old manzanita that had been pulled out by the roots that was sitting in that was inverted and stuck into the ground and the root ball made a perfect seat. And you could look over the entire valley below from this, from this perch. Huh? Yeah. That was up there. That's pretty weird. I mean, I I've seen pictures of like inverted trees like that in strange places, you know? Yeah. Um, that was my first encounter with that whole, whole situation. I was just like, there's no one up here that would do that. Like this is, this is remote. This is a remote place. Like I wouldn't even think like a miner from the 1800s, like even got up there, you know, like it, it was just so ridiculously remote. Like we, we just picked a random line to go up, mm -hmm. you know, so it was just haphazard that we had found that. And, uh, yeah. Did you have any problems, you know, with your farm or anything like missing items or anything like that? Um, yeah, you occasionally get like a pant, a plant pulled out, um, and stuff like that. But there was like a bunch of bears up there too. Yeah. I think that they like to, you could tell what it was because there would be like prints in the ground, in the loose soil. Right. So yeah, we would have problems with bears up there. But, uh, 
like I would, you know, I ended up camping out there up there for, for many, many, many times over the years, pretty much all summer and in the fall, um, every night. And then occasionally you would hear like animals walking through. And sometimes I swear I just heard two feet instead of four because you could tell the difference. Yeah. And, um, you were always on guard for stuff like people coming up there, but ne- I never saw a person come up there. I never saw any tracks of a people of people. Um, but the thing to remember is that soil up there is like super hard in summertime. Like it's easy to dig in winter, but in summertime it just turns to cement. So things aren't really leaving tracks up there yeah. in the summer. Yeah. Um, so, but, uh, yeah, there was another weird thing. There was a couple other weird things up there. One of them, my, they had, they both happened to my buddy. It was my partner. Um, so like right around the early times where this was going on, um, they were, they were leaving the property and, uh, he said that he had seen this giant black lion jump across the road in one bound up like 20 feet onto the hillside and like vanish in the woods within like a split second, him, his, his uh, wife and their two kids all saw this thing. And it's what he describes as being a, uh, like a, a black Panther. That's what he thinks he saw. Huh? Yeah. I don't know if it's one of those things where, you know, you, you see something strange and you don't know how to process it. So you say something else. Yeah. But yeah, he clearly swears he saw a black Panther. Now I did see mountain lion. I did see a mountain lion up there one time. And, uh, it was huge, but it was, it was just a normal mountain lion. Like it wasn't black. Right. So that was one weird thing. And, um, and then another time he was, uh, camping near this mountain bully. Uh, do I want to say it? Yeah, whatever. Bully shoot. And, uh, he was, um, on this back road and he swears that something was like stalking him and he wouldn't really go into detail but this guy was not afraid of, of bears or mountain lions. Like he was always heavily armed. <laughs> and so this, whatever he, whatever he saw, like I got the impression that he didn't want to talk about it, but it was probably like some kind of a Bigfoot thing. And he just said, like he was just sitting there in his car and he was getting stalked by this thing. And he just like got the heck out of there and he never went back. I just wonder what's the deal with the, you know, the big black cats, uh, I had a friend that, you know, talked about one on his family's property here. Really? And like, yeah, he he and his brother, his older brother and his dad all saw it. And I think his dad even like tried to shoot it one time and uh, either missed. I mean, you know, the way he told the story was there's no way my dad would have missed. <laughs> you know, but like it didn't drop it or anything. It just like kind of flicked its tail and then bounded off through the woods. And I've heard like so many stories about them and everything, but like according to the information that I've read, like whatever it's called, melanistic uh, traits or whatever in mountain lions just aren't really possible for them to, for like a mountain lion just to genetically be black like that. Okay. So they've kind of ruled out the idea that it's just, you know, a black mountain lion. So it would have to be something else, you know. But the the reports of them are so widespread. And I have to admit, this is like the first time I recall hearing about one in California. Down here, you know, I'm in Oklahoma. You hear about them in, you know, all throughout the south and everything. And obviously in Florida, there's a lot of reports of them. But I, I don't I don't recall hearing about them up there. So that's really interesting. You know, again, if you're listening and you have a story about a black cat in California or the Pacific Northwest, email me. I'd love to hear about it. Uh, I'm kind of interested in there. It's just something, you know, like that was like one of the first things that I read about whenever I was a kid, whenever I got into like all the unexplained phenomenon stuff. Nice. And it's, and it's just weird that, you know, so many people see them, but. Uh, nobody has any idea what they are or anything. Uh, one thing, one possibility is speaking of like the genetic morph thing is like the Jaguar. Mm-hmm. I believe can have a melanistic 
straight. Yeah. And they, they're, they're black. And it, I think there's Jaguars in South America, maybe Mexico. If I'm not mistaken, yeah. I have no idea. Yeah. Um, there's actually another, uh, large cat called a Jagarundi, Jagarundi, uh, from South America. That's actually worked its way up here into the States. Wow. And, uh, they've been spotted in Oklahoma as a matter of fact, but, and they're like a spotted cat type thing, but they're not huge or anything like what we're talking about. Okay. Yeah. This thing that he saw, he said was huge. And, uh, yeah. I mean, if it, if that can get up in Oklahoma, then, you know, it could probably get to California. Yeah. Just as we, you know, I mean, people think like, you know, th- say for instance, death Valley, people think that it's just like a big flat, empty desert, you know, but it's actually, if you look at a map on Google earth or whatever, you, you can see the green belts extending and they, they follow the mountaintops. So there's, there's like Ponderosa, pine forest up on the mountaintops and like all kinds of trees up there and they extend in a north to south direction along the ridge tops and so the travel is possible to be kind of like go undetected for something like that to travel like a cat or you know bigfoot or whatever um that's totally possible that way and there's not a lot of people up there so if, if you kind of like look where the green spaces are you know there's a direct line from like southern california to northern california so i always thought about that with the whole my whole encounter in death valley with the the uh, the gorilla screams i was like well i mean if there was a if there was a bigfoot then that's where they would be in that area you know at least during yeah at least uh i guess i don't know during the day and night i don't know but um but yeah it seems like that's where they would be because it's really hot in summertime down there (laughs) Yeah, I was just talking to uh, my buddy Richie about some Bigfoot stuff in Southern California. And there's actually quite a bit of stuff in Southern California, and people don't really think about Bigfoot being in Southern California. And then I had uh, a lady on that had a Bigfoot sighting down in Mexico, and I had never heard of that before. Uh, So it, it just seems like, you know, obviously people hear all the stories about, you know, the four corners regions and Bigfoot, you know, Arizona and New Mexico and everything. I mean, these things aren't necessarily just strictly associated with these large expansive forests of the Pacific Northwest or anything. Uh, any habitat where they can survive, it seems like you can find them. It's, it's pretty crazy. Yeah. I, what I think like, you know, less Stroud with his whole Bigfoot thing. Mm-hmm. He was talking pretty much anywhere that a bear can live, a Bigfoot could live. Yeah. And it makes sense. You know, I mean, bears are huge. I mean, one of the things that we used to look for is uh, good populations of deer and coyote in an area. Ah. Like, we didn't, you know, there's a lot of bears here, but not as much as uh, there are in, you know, California or anything like that, or as you get farther north. Um, but, uh, it seems like if there's a healthy population of deer and or coyotes, uh, there's usually Bigfoot around. I got one more little Bigfoot and then I'll jump into the aliens. <laughs> so um, this is kind of like this is kind of like the craziest one yet. Um, so uh, I decided to go to college and was working as a biologist up in Northern California on a, on a Native American reservation. And I ended up having that job for like three years. But um, the first night on that reservation, uh, I woke up in the middle of the night and I was like, basically, people want to say it was sleep paralysis, but I don't really think that's what it was. Because I was sitting there standing face to face with a big black Bigfoot. And... um, it was looking at me. I was laying down, like, but I was awake. And this thing was looking at me from outside. And there was no wall between us, you know? And it was, like, staring, like, deep into my soul. And I was a, literally a, a huge sense of dread is all I can describe. And, uh, yeah, so that happened. And then, excuse me, a couple years later, 
um, I was at this um, little ceremony and I was talking to to the shaman, the shaman guy there. And they do these uh, vision quests where they they go up way into these sacred places and they carry stones from the river, which, you know, kind of harkens back to uh, <laughs> the whole thing with the stone up on the mountain. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, there was, I didn't, have, I didn't ever find any like native American circles up there on that mountain, but um, there, there was these old stone circles from their ancestors. I don't want to get, you know, out of respect. I don't want to get like too into the details. I probably said too much already, but like, basically probably going to say too much even more because um yeah so they would go sit in these circles for like a week and that was like their protection circle right 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 and um didn't really think about like what are they being protected from you know but like he was the probably like halfway into his journey his uh vision quest or whatever like he heard that in the middle of the night he heard this like in like weird laughing or like this like this kind of sinister. He described it as like a sinister laugh down in the valley below, and he thought it was his friends playing a trick on him. But then he was like, "Wait, there's nobody up here. Like I'm in the middle of nowhere. You know, you got to walk like 20 miles to get to the spot." And um, so like he pretty much just. Uh, maybe he was hallucinating or whatever, you know, you go for a long time without food or water. You, you, your mind starts playing tricks, but, uh, well, I take that back. I think they were able to drink water, but, um, so the next night he heard it, but it was closer. And then he started hearing like scratching on the, on the mountain and like nails. And it sounded like someone was like climbing up. And then the next night he heard it again, but this time, it, you know, the climbing got closer and then he looks up on this promontory right next to him, and there was a big black uh, Sasquatch staring at him. And he said it leapt from the promontory right towards him, and right when it hit the stone circle, it dissolved into nothing. It just vanished. Just vanished. And he, they talk about how it's like, well, I don't, I, I don't really want to say anymore. But yeah, I mean... Do the do with that what you will. <laughs> I just thought it was interesting because it kind of it kind of brings everything in my story to a conclusion because you got like the stone circle thing, mm -hmm. the river rock. You got, you know, I'm actually I actually saw it, and then he's describing the same exact thing that I personally actually saw in that dream time. So I believe him. I mean, he did, he doesn't have anything to gain from making up a story like that, you know? Right. Like this area that I was in is very famous for Bigfoot activity. Uh, in fact, the Patty film was was shot about 20 miles from where he was or where I used to work. So that's a little hint if anybody wants to research where this could have been. But uh, but yeah, what happened whenever you saw the one in Dreamtime? It was I, I describe it as like it was like reading my soul. Mm -hmm. It was like, who is this guy? Like, what you know, what are you all about? You're 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 not supposed to be here or, you know, you've never been here before. And so I feel like it was just, yeah, it was just standing there. I'm not going to say it had red eyes, but it, it definitely, its eyes seemed shiny, maybe like an orange or like a red. Were you like inside a building? Were you in a tent? When, where were you? I was in a house. Okay. And this thing um, was the direction that he was standing was right towards this back property where there was a, it was just, it was abandoned. There was an abandoned property. It was like this old, this old house back there. And it had one of those street lights in the yard, but the street light would always like flicker and it would go on and off. So it was like super spooky. And uh, yeah, it was standing like right around there back in that back property. But it was, it was, I mean, in that direction, but it was like right on the other side of the wall of the house. And it was looking at me through the through the walls. So I mean, it was like it felt real, and I was fully awake and conscious. But obviously, like we were in some other kind of space. It was analyzing me, and I while it was while it had me trapped in its gaze, I could not move, and I could not talk or scream or anything. I just felt like 
total dread. Um, and maybe that's just like a sense of the unknown and you, your fear where you don't know. But yeah, I just felt absolute complete dread. And like, if this thing wanted to, you know, kill me, it could, it could have easily done that. The, uh, native American man that shared his story with you, like what was his opinion? Are they, you know, evil, not evil. Is it like a spiritual type thing? The way that it vanished and everything, was it like a sense of like the one that he was talking about was the same one you saw? That I'm not sure, but, um, I didn't tell him about my story. Uh, okay. Uh, but yeah, I don't know why he shared that with me. Honestly, it was pretty special though, but I just feel like he shared it with me maybe so I could share it with other people because you know, they don't really like to talk about it. Right. Just out of, of ridicule and stuff. But like, at the same time, if you don't ever tell anybody, then it just dies with you. So maybe he just wanted to get it out there. Like kind of like how I want to get this out there right yeah. now. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. Uh, but, um, I don't know about the, I think what, from what I gathered, they kind of think that it kind of travels between the two worlds mm -hmm. and it can be spiritual and it can be physical. It has some kind of like advanced, understanding of how what what you know what we could, could be capable of if we were more tapped into nature perhaps right the, as far as like evil and and stuff um i'm not i don't really think they think they're evil but i think that they they will test you kind of like how i was testing me and kind of like how i was testing him to see if he was going to get afraid and run away or something um, and you know what? This actually reminds me, uh, the, the company I used to work for out there, uh, the, the foreman, his wife, when she was a, a little girl, she was playing in her yard and saw a Bigfoot staring at her not far away. And um, he told me the story one day. And then I actually talked to her about it. And she was like, yeah, that really happened. And she was dead serious. So like the people out there, kind of like don't really like to talk about it but if they trust you or whatever they'll tell you stuff like that yeah so it's it, it's pretty uh prevalent you know stories like that out there and i've had i've heard other stories of of other guys out there that with with crazy stuff like when they were kids trying to like reach in the the window and grab them and stuff like that um so there i mean there's just there's something about being you know they would always say like don't go outside you get you know captured by the bigfoot or whatever when you're a kid yeah and like they, they literally meant that though because <laughs> they just saw it's you know there's a lot of activity out there yeah it sounds very similar to like the type of stuff you hear uh all over really whenever it comes to like rural america or whatever and bigfoot stuff it's like they don't really talk about it or anything but if they trust you and they get to know you and everything, you start hearing stories all the time from everybody. It seems like. Yeah, exactly, man. Exactly. Kind of like Georgia. Like I was surprised here. There's like everywhere you go, there's like those little Bigfoot statues or it's like the little plywood cutouts. Yeah. Of Bigfoot. They're everywhere out here and people have like Bigfoot stickers on their cars and trucks. And you know, it's very prevalent. And I was, I was kind of surprised. Yeah, like growing up in Virginia, I I never thought that was going on up there. But now it comes to find, I mean, I would go hiking out on the Appalachian Trail like all the time when I was growing up alone. And now I come, I come to find out that like that, even there's even activity going on out there. I'm just like, oh, man. But it would, you would always feel like spooked out sometimes, you know, when you're out there and you just get that feeling. And you're just like, oh, what is that? So Bigfoot's not the only thing you've experienced, though. Right. Right. <laughs> this is good. People are going to laugh on this one. Okay. But, um, July, 2005 Marvin's mountaintop, West Virginia, all good festival. It was like this awesome little music festival. Um, me and my girlfriend were, went to it and it's basically like this, this big grass, uh, hill. And on the back of the hill is a tree line. And it's out in the middle of nowhere. And um, 
so it just like goes to mountains like this like you're at the top of the mountain and it goes down to a valley and then it just goes to more mountains and uh so we're there and this was crazy man like um string cheese incident went on and you know everybody's everybody was there to see that and so i mean that place was packed and right during their set like their first set it started to like torrentially downpour and they kept playing and uh i mean it was raining hard but the electricity in the air was was some there was something strange going like everybody there was like very like into it like everybody was dancing i mean you know usually at a usually at a, a festival or something there's always like some people dance and some people standing but like everybody was dancing everybody was like into this thing and it was just completely downpour raining it was it was ridiculous and uh right around then this orange flare went up in the air from somewhere in the crowd and at first it's like oh yeah someone's lighting up fireworks but this orange flare hovered up in the air for probably like a good i want to say a good five or ten minutes and it didn't come down like it just stayed up in the air and uh this is 2005 so this is not like drones are happening you know so what could that have been i mean it sounds like what people describe as like the brown mountain lights type thing oh shoot i didn't even think about that like i i've heard and not just the brown mountain lights but like i've heard uh well uh jonathan dodd and uh the guys of moth boys podcast saw something uh very similar to what you're describing if i remember correctly uh i mean they saw some other stuff but like originally just the light type situation yeah but i've talked to uh joe and jesse doyle of hillbent holler and they have some remarkable footage of the brown mountain lights and it sounds like you're describing those uh the same type thing like a mm. basically an orb that comes up from nowhere and hovers in the sky wow yeah i've heard of the brown mountain lights i actually went and camped out there a couple times when i was younger and never got to see anything unfortunately but I, i've seen them on there's like some youtube videos now i don't know maybe that's the same one you're talking about but i've, I've seen them on these youtube videos but yeah so this thing went up in the air and it was like lit up the whole crowd, kind of. I mean, like not really, but it was kind of dark anyway. Um, and then it just the energy just rose like a thousand percent. <laughs> and anyone that was at this show will tell you that like this was one of the most magical string cheese shows they ever saw. And um, and then so right when the rain stopped and this thing like went away. Um, for some reason I just happened to look behind me and I'm staring at the, at the tree line and right where I'm looking, this UFO stereotypical UFO, like all the flashing lights. And one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen, um, comes out of the tree line or sorry, over the tree line and hovers like just like a few feet away from the trees and it's like it's like they were just there to see the show or something like and then i look around the entire i like scan the entire crowd no one else is seeing this thing everyone's looking ahead at string cheese and i looked over at my girlfriend she's staring at because she had seen me staring at it and she's looking back and i was like you see that she's like yeah and it just like hovered there for like 30 seconds and then just swoop slowly backs away i, I was like what <laughs> yeah yeah (laughs) what (laughs) it was like those are real because i had been a big fan of x-files and stuff but you know like you don't really think that stuff is real when you're a kid i mean i'm probably like 20 maybe like 22 and uh yeah they are real now i don't know who was driving it but um yeah that was my first encounter when i realized that there is something else out there 
at a string cheese incident <laughs> to her concert <laughs> music festival. And no, not on mushrooms or you know anything like that. Um, I I think we were actually completely sober. Like I don't even think I had smoked any weed or anything. Um, yeah. So <laughs> I know what people are gonna say no, weren't tripping. And yeah, so it's just so, so random. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And I don't, I've, I've, I've been into the like, you know, concert archives when people like kind of talk about the show and no one ever mentions that. People mention the orange orb thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I've heard that like a couple of times that people mention the rain, how it was and the energy. People always talk about the energy of that show. And it's like, oh, if only you knew. Like there was something strange going on on that night on that show. I I mean, did it look like a, a saucer? Yes, like like an actual flying saucer. Like, what color were the lights? Do you remember? It, it was it was an actual flying saucer, and the lights were um, multicolored. They were all different colors, and I kind of like you know the haze of time kind of erodes the memory. Right. So I don't. I just. If I can, if I can close my eyes, I can just see it there, though, you know. But I don't remember like the exact specifics. But it had like a little, the little dome thing on top. Um, but it wasn't like a, a perfect dome. It was kind of like angular a little bit. It looked like maybe it was like older model. I don't know. But <laughs> vintage UFO. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was like a vintage, and uh, the lights were like on the bottom, or maybe like around the sides a little bit. And then there was like a, a like a a, a a ring of like windows around it and the lights were just like it wasn't like bright enough to light up the crowd like the orb was doing so it was some kind of like weird lights that weren't like casting any kind of like glow if that makes no sense but it was just like you had to you wouldn't notice it unless you were looking right at it because it wasn't creating any shadows or anything like that um but it was like i said it was just like the most beautiful thing i've ever seen and like obviously, I mean, uh, they don't really do this at like outdoor music festivals. But I'm just saying, if it were some sort of you know part of the show, basically, they're obviously going to do it in front of the crowd where everybody can see it, not behind the crowd where nobody's looking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. I've thought about that too. I mean, um, I know nowadays. You know, like if you go to a fish show or something nowadays, like they got crazy stuff going on. Yeah. Like they yeah. Flying around and they stuff like that. But nah, back then, man, like nothing like that was, I mean, yeah, there was some stuff, but like not like the crazy like dragon drones that they have <laughs> flying around. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, nothing like that. And uh, yeah, man, it was just, yeah, it was just completely silent. I saw it from probably like, you know, it was like right above the tree line. So what, like 40, 50 feet off the ground, maybe a little more. And I was probably like not even a hundred yards away from it because we were kind of in the back. I mean, I saw it close. Wow. And and no sound. It was just like they were just popping in for a little visit. And they're like, oh, this is cool. Oh, this dude sees us. Let's let's back (laughs) up a little bit. (laughs) It's kind of what it seemed like. But, uh, But yeah. So the next thing that happened was, um, so we're, we're flashing. This was right before I went to Maine. Um, so the next thing that happened was when I was in Maine, uh, the next two things are going to be in Maine. And, uh, this was in a little place called Heartland, Maine, which is near where I was before. And, uh, I was, I was working on a farm with some friends. This was after the, the, uh, the medicine, you know, lady and had met some friends and was living with them, working on this farm out there. This was just an organic uh, food farm. And, um, so one night, uh, I was out in the sauna. I had, I had my tent set up in this, this sauna and this was like fall. So it was getting a little chilly, but it wasn't like freezing. And, um, I'm sitting in the sauna playing guitar and all of a sudden, like, I started seeing these geometric shapes, like purple, like um, how I would describe as maybe like the flower of life symbol or something. Okay. Uh, But I started seeing these geometric shapes out of nowhere. And 
all of a sudden then I got the sense of like, oh, there's something directly above me that just flew over me. And then I got this like crazy sense of dread. And um, I remember being like, oh, please don't abduct me. Like, (laughs) I feel I feel like this is, I feel like I've had experiences in the past that I have blocked out of my memory. I, I know there was some times growing up where I, I would be outside at two in the morning when I was like a kid playing what my dad said was playing basketball. But like he, I was like, why well, I wasn't playing basketball. He's like, yeah, you were playing basketball. I was like, well, why was I outside at 2 a.m.? He's like, oh, don't worry about it. And just like weird stuff like that would happen. And uh, so I feel like right when this, as incident happened like i knew who it was and um i just i jumped up and i ran out to the field and i i was like you know wait till i have a girlfriend come back when i have a girlfriend i can't take this right now you know like i'm in an emotionally fragile state i was like saying all this stuff and then right then this from the from across the street a light shot up in the sky at like five thousand miles an hour and was gone and it was like, yeah, a bright flash, like a white light, just like poof, up into the sky from the from below the trees, um, right across the street. So then the, the next night, some friends had also seen some stuff up in the sky while we were talking, and they were like, "What is that?" And then when I turned around, it was gone. But um, but there was there was some there was some weird stuff out there. That's what I can say. And so this this culminates. Um, that winter had a girlfriend and I was living in this remote uh, kind of like ski cabin up near ski resort. And I was renovating it for my buddy. And um, pretty much that's when I had my missing time encounter where um, I woke up and there was like this blue light coming through the window and I knew instantly who it was. And I just got down I, I was laying, um, I was sleeping on the floor because I didn't have a bed at this time. And I always like slept on my stomach or my side. And so I just like rolled up on my knees and like crouched down. And I was just like, you know, hit me with the wand or something like that. I don't, I can't deal with this right now. <laughs> and so when I woke up, um, when I woke up, I was laying on my back and I was facing the opposite direction. And I never sleep on my back and I, yeah. And I was facing the opposite direction and I got up and uh, I had an appointment. I thought that day, but it was not like Tuesday. It was Wednesday. And so I had missed my appointment and I had lost like 24 hours of time basically. And um, I have, I had like memories, like very faint memories of like, pretty much being on it was actually like um there's like military people there and it was there might have you know there might have been others there but that's what i recall in my memory and i remember being um kind of like i remember the the train being red and there was like plastic black plastic bags like covering the hillside it's just like these flashes of memory. It's all I have of that experience. And I always wanted to do the hypnotic regression thing and see what was going on there. But uh, I haven't done that yet, but I should. And uh, yeah, so that was that was the missing time uh, encounter. Um, and it was funny. I had a girlfriend at the time, so they were just like waiting for me to have a girlfriend or something like, I don't know. And the military were like our military uh that i don't know but human military figures yes yeah human military uh, we were on like some kind of craft but it wasn't like a it wasn't like a airplane but we were we were definitely like it's yeah we were definitely flying or you know we were like above the ground in some kind of craft and uh um yeah, and then it seemed like we were maybe in just this really exotic location when I was walking around. So I don't know if that was like I don't know if that was this planet or or what or if it's all just a dream, you know. But it it just I've never slept for 
you know, 24 straight hours and just like woke up in a weird position and had a memory of blue lights coming in the window and like these beings in my room. So I, I honestly believe that I was abducted that night and for what cause, I don't know. And, you know, I believe that potentially that night before they were going to do that, but they, they honored my wishes to, to wait till I had a girlfriend. And you believe <laughs> that you might've been abducted whenever you were young. I don't have memories of it, but just like strange things would happen where I would be outside. Uh, so yeah, I think that's a possibility. I think I've, just because for me to like know who it was when I was in that sauna and I just felt the presence and to know what it was, was strange because I had never had any memory of anything like that before. And then all of a sudden I just knew who it was. So I'm uh, a person who is very much against doing this, but I'm going to <laughs> make an exception in this case. Uh, if you take the UFO stuff and then you take the Bigfoot stuff, do you think those things are connected? I, I like that question because before I never would have thought that, but now I am leaning towards that possibility. I've been thinking about it a lot, um, preparing for this show and stuff. And, um, yeah, I, I think it's a possibility. What, what do you think? I mean, so, <laughs> geez, I don't like to be asked questions on my own show. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you know, you hear stories not just from eyewitnesses, but also from investigators of seeing, like, orbs and stuff. And, like I said, I don't like to connect the two. I don't think that necessarily because you're out looking for a Bigfoot and then you see something else that it's somehow connected to Bigfoot or that if you think Bigfoot is in the area and then you see something else that they're connected. Yeah. I, I know that early on in my research, you did hear, you know, stories about UFOs and Bigfoot. And that is a theory out there that, you know, they are connected. Mm -hmm. Right. But like, as I've gotten older, uh, there's something going on, man. I don't know what it is, but people out there aren't experiencing just one phenomenon. They're experiencing a bunch of different things over their lifetime. Not everybody, but some people. Right. And I'm very interested in that because I'm one of those people. I've experienced various things. Uh, and I don't know if they're connected or if they're connected through the person that witnesses them, but it just seems like more times than not, it's like once you get to talking to people, if they've experienced something substantial in one area, then they also have experiences in other areas. Uh, so... I mean, it's, it's just really tough to say. I, I just don't know. And I think that's the problem. I think most people don't really know. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it's got to be a possibility. It, it, there's got to be at least the possibility that these things are connected somehow. Or right. uh, something in us allows us to have these experiences more so than just a typical person. I don't know. Yeah, I, I I can tell you what the uh, certain Native American shaman would tell you, and it's like the or like how they travel around, and uh, you know, you know Bobo, I'm sure. Sure, of course. Yeah, he talks about when he was in the area that I'm talking about. He probably knows exactly where I'm talking about, and like he was uh, in an area around there. And he saw a blue orb. I believe what he said was like a blue orb, like turn into a Bigfoot or a big turn into a blue orb or something like that. And like all that. So he actually saw that. And then like, um, all the, a lot of the 
Native American, you know, guys that are in the know would tell you that that's how they travel around. And there was this whole story that Bobo tells about this, like, uh, old Native American, like, shaman guy that everybody loved and all the animals loved him. And he would just, like, walk out in the field and, like, ravens would come, like, sit on his shoulder and just crazy stuff like that. And uh, he was the one that was like, yeah, that's how they travel around. Just like it was, like, natural fact. Like, everybody should know that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but how that pertains to the UFOs and all that stuff, you know, no idea. But that's just an interesting little tidbit. And it leads into my last little story here. And uh, this one was in 2010. I actually reported this one on MUFON. I don't know why I didn't report the other one on MUFON. It just it just seems so unbelievable. Like, <laughs> you're at a music festival and you see a UFO. Okay. But this one was... This one, I don't know. This one just seemed a little more believable, I guess. But near that place where I was was living, in, on near that 400-acre ranch out in Northern California, this mountain called Bully Shoot Mountain, very beautiful mountain. It's like 7,000 feet. And when you're on the top of that thing, you can see 100 miles away, like, you know, and the I-5 looks like Christmas tree lights just, like, cast down the Central Valley of california so we would just go up there you know and just hang out and it was like a fire lookout up there um so this particular night we were going we were heading up there it's pretty late um and me and my buddy uh and pretty much like um we were we ran into like this big snow bank so we had to park the car and just start walking and so we started we were just walking on this mountain and we come to this little curve in the road and where you're looking out all over Redding below and then all the way down to Central Valley. And then right then we see this at first I thought it was an ATV coming or like a car. It had those like amber color car lights, like the older cars, not like the ungodly bright car lights they have nowadays, but like the older amber color car light. Yeah. It was like coming up through the 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 ridge that was coming up from the from the valley below and it was just like cruising up the ridge and we were like oh that's weird that there's a i didn't know there was a road there and we were like wait there isn't a road there this is it's like middle of nowhere there's like we're on the road (laughs) and so right then this thing does a 90 degree angle and starts traveling out in space or like out in the air uh between the ridge and where we were standing and it, it it's, it's like going away from us a little bit, and then it turns directly toward us. And it was a orange orb. You know, it was just, it was like, I don't know how big it was, but um, when I, the MUFON lady was talking about like, well, if you hold like a penny up to your outstretched arm, like how big was it? And I would say, you know, maybe about the size of a nickel or something. Um. So maybe it was like 20 feet across. Maybe it was somewhere, somewhere around there. Like it was pretty big. It wasn't huge. Uh, it could have been 10 feet, but it was, it was just like this orange orb and it wasn't shimmering. It wasn't glowing. It was just completely orange. And it was, it was, uh, it was amazing. But it, the, but when it turned and started flying towards it, it was hovering. Like it wasn't really going very fast. It was just like, you know, just bound, bounding up the hillside and then just like starts and then it like saw us and then it like turned directly towards us and started coming directly towards us. And probably when it got within like 200 or 300 yards or something, I freaked out and I started running away. And I was, I, <laughs> I, I was like, I ain't having no close encounter of the third kind up here tonight as I'm like running away. And my buddy was just staring at this thing like, like in a trance. So he just stood there and I'm running away. And then I get over the little ridge and I see he's not following me. And I'm like, oh, dang. So I, I like ran back. And then when, right when I got back, this thing was going away. And then it just kind of, it's weird. Cause I don't remember, I don't remember it like what happened as far as how it disappeared, but it just kind of like covered away. And, uh, yeah. And we, you know, we were just like in disbelief and, uh, 
One thing I didn't mention though is when we were walking up that road, we both felt extremely electrified. Like we both felt so good. We were just like, you feel that? It's like, yeah, I feel like amazing right now. And um, and then we saw that. And so when I was talking to the MUFON lady, she had said that that lookout, they used to allow people to spend the night there. And um, one of the stories she heard was a lady that was spending the night in the fire lookout. And she had seen the exact same thing that we had seen, this orange orb oh, wow. going up. Yeah. So she had heard stories about this place. And nobody knows about this place. I don't even like the fact that I'm talking about it because it's like my fun little. <laughs> <laughs> so nobody go. No, I'm just kidding. But um, but yeah, like, and another story was um that she had told me was down on uh, it's called Indian Creek that flows down from Bully Shoot down to Highway 299, and down there there's this uh, lodge. It's called Indian Creek Lodge, and this the this other sighting was this guy was at Indian Creek Lodge and had seen an, like orange orbs up in the vicinity of where this fire lookout was. Um, and of note that this uh, mountain, uh, if you're standing on top of it, it's, it's like the geology is like, there's like quartz, uh, quartz, and then it turns into like dark metamorphic. And so this mountain is like on the divide and it was a old historic gold mine. Um, so it's got layers of like quartz and sedimentary rock. Um, and like, you know, there's, there's my theory that this is like a place of high energy on the, because of that. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know what it was, but it seemed like it was intelligent though. It seemed like it was intelligent. Like when it saw us, it just like came right towards us. You know, that's, that's a thing that I've picked up on from talking to different people, uh, that have encounters like the one you're talking about is they feel that it's intelligent and is specifically aware of them, uh, which is interesting to me. Uh, you know, I talked to my buddy, Jonathan Dodd, the artist that did the graphics for the show and everything. He was on here and talking to him about his UFO experience. They felt the same way. And I just, found that really interesting because I'm thinking like, and I talked to him about it. Like you guys were observing it from this point for all, you know, there could have been somebody five miles away observing the same thing at the same time. Would they feel like they were being singled out by this thing? Would they feel that intelligence connection and reaction that you did? And uh, here you are bringing it up again. And it, it's just, there's something to that, man. There's there's something to it. Uh, it yeah. I used to talk about uh, people's Bigfoot experiences, how whenever they have a Bigfoot encounter, it feels very personal. Like they were specifically singled out to have that encounter or whatever. Yes, and that's it, how I felt. And it seems like this is also a theme with the UFO stuff or orbs or whatever you want to call it. You were talking about that energized feeling. Would yes. you say it's the same as what you experienced at the concert? Well, you know what? Now that you mention it, I did feel that similar kind of feeling when when everybody was dancing and we and that orange orb was up in the in the sky at the concert. Um, but yeah, I mean, maybe they were a little similar. Now that you mention it, I mean, but at concerts, a lot of people feel that way, you know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It was more like a communal, like. I guess you would say like a communal high or whatever uh, pun on intended, but like at the bully shoot thing, it was, it was more singular, um, but it was a similar thing. But the, I would say, I, I would say I've never felt so energized as being on bully shoot that night. It was just insane. Like we felt so energized, like we could just lift up and fly away. <laughs> It also sounds like uh, a couple of the instances, like the missing time and everything, was definitely a, a different feeling to you than these were. Yes. Yeah, the missing time thing was freaky, man. Like, I'm still freaked out about that. I mean, you were talking about, you know, like, 
don't abduct me, <laughs> you know, wait until I have a girlfriend, all that stuff. Uh, as opposed to this, and I mean, I know you took off running and everything, but it's like, it definitely seems like you had different emotional response to the two different instances. Yeah, that's a really good point. I did. Yeah. Uh, I think part of it is part of me really does want to like go on a UFO and get in, get taken to exotic locations in space. But when the moment actually arrives, you're not ready for that. You know, like you don't want to do that. When you... Well, I mean, it all sounds like fun and games, but as soon as the control factor is removed from the equation where you're not in charge of the trip, uh, I don't think anybody would want to. Right. You don't, you don't, you don't know who it is. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it could be a good, be some good guys or it could be some bad guys you know yeah i mean there's a lot of people that say they want to see a bigfoot and i'm like are, are you sure <laughs> like do you really <laughs> i mean in what situation do you want to see one right yeah because you never look at the woods the same way again when you that's one thing that i can say that like i still have the benefit of doubt because i haven't even though i saw that one in dream time i still could say that that was just a dream right and i haven't actually one in the wild so when i go out and explore in the wild or like do hikes and stuff you know like only in the dark of night do i shudder like it's like more, most of the time i'm 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 like yeah that's maybe it's you know maybe i i know i believe but i'm like i still have that benefit of the doubt but if i actually saw one then i would be freaked out and would never want to go in the woods <laughs> yeah yeah that happens a lot <laughs> happens a lot yeah. I mean I've heard stories about people that were like you know field researchers or whatever and then they saw one and they quit like that was it like uh, nope well, what were you looking for you that was the whole point but or, or like hunters that had hunted their whole lives and that was their entire you know thing in life and then they just never hunted again yeah. after they saw them. like yeah so part of me kind of wants to see one but part of me also is like well I really like being outside at night, you know, playing guitar around the campfire kind of thing. Like, I don't know if I would do that if I knew that there was just. But another part of me is like, I just want to know truth regardless of anything. So maybe, maybe I do want to see one, like actually see one. Maybe I don't. <laughs> Whenever I was a little kid, I don't know if this. So like there's a key point in my childhood uh, where I acquired this little paperback book. I've talked about it before, but this little book had stories of Bigfoot and the Loch Ness Monster. Like, it was divided in half. And, and that was my first real introduction to Bigfoot. Now, I had seen, like, some reruns of In Search Of, I believe, and reenactments of, like, the Ape Canyon incident. But that book by far was the first thing that kind of hooked me on the Bigfoot subject. But I don't remember if I had the book first or this happened first. We had a lake house and it was just a trailer, like a mobile home. And uh, we would go up there on the weekends and stay there during the summer or spring break whenever I was out of school or whatever. And my bedroom was on the very end and there was one single window in my bedroom that was next to my bed at on the end of the trailer. And I had this dream that there was something at the window. And I got up and looked out the window, and there was a Bigfoot standing there. And its hair, uh, growing up, whenever I'd, you know, talk about this dream because it was so, you know, it freaked me out. I, I would refer to it as like calico because that's the only thing I could think of was like a calico cat because its hair was different colors. It wasn't like a uniform color. And I mean, whenever I had this dream, it had to have been like, geez, dude, <laughs> I may, was maybe nine years old. So here I am all these years later and I can still see it just as vivid as when it happened uh and this bigfoot was just standing there outside my window and it well, feels bro <laughs> and it like 
there is these woods, okay, like the front of our trailer faced this big, huge pasture, a big open field, and then on the other side of the field were these woods. And I go exploring the woods all the time as a kid. That's what I called it, going exploring. And this Bigfoot pointed at the woods and then motioned for me to follow it. It like motioned for me <laughs> to come outside. And I was like, no, <laughs> you know, and I like pulled the curtain shut. And that's whenever I woke up from the dream. And uh, people make fun of me <laughs> that I've told this story to that know it because in my head, for whatever reason, the Bigfoot had a name that sounded like David, but it's, it wasn't David. It wasn't the name David. But it like maybe day fit or something like that. It, I don't know, but I just remember that particular. That's amazing, man. Like that a lot. Like the motioning thing with the kids. You hear that yeah, a lot. Yeah, and this was like I mean, maybe I had the dream because I was reading the book. Like I mean, that's what makes the most sense, right? Uh, but I mean, the dream's still with me, man, and. I'm a firm believer. I'm one of those those weirdos that thinks that some dreams are just dreams, and then some dreams aren't just dreams. Oh, dude, I and totally that's, relate. <laughs> you know, and here I am uh, all these years later doing Bigfoot stuff, and, I mean, it's a huge part of my life, and I just always think back to that dream as a little kid. Like, what was that exactly, you know? So when... So when you pulled the curtains and then you woke up, was it like, are you sure it was a dream? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Cause it's, cause there it's was some, hard to tell. there were some other weird things that happened. Uh, you know, hindsight, right. Uh, before we got the trailer, uh, we originally bought a boat dock, like an enclosed boathouse. And whenever we first got it, I mean, I was five whenever we purchased that. So we would drive up there, but we would just stay in a, a camper on the back of the pickup truck. That's where we would sleep. And I remember it was early one morning, like it was still dark out. And my grandparents raised me, so I'm with my grandparents. And my grandfather is awake. Like he's up in the trailer, like looking out the windows and he's got a gun with him, but he's not going outside of the camper. <laughs> and I'm just like, what's going on? You know? Cause like, I'm scared now. Like my grandpa's up with a gun, <laughs> you know, it's dark out. What's going on. And I yeah. remember him saying something's messing with the camper and walking around the truck. That's all he said. And I, it seems like I vaguely remember like asking him, you know, well, what is it? And he was like, I don't know. I think it might be a hog or something. But like back then we didn't have like wild hogs up here. Like, <laughs> like that wasn't a thing yet. Huh. And I don't know why he would say that if he heard a noise like one or something. He And why would you have a gun? Why would you be afraid of a wild Yeah, hog? because I he wasn't, I mean, like, this dude, <laughs> you know, like, raised in the woods hunting and fishing. Like, he's not afraid of anything. Yeah. So it was, it was, that always stood out. And then, like, there was an incident that actually happened in the woods where I don't know what it was. Something took off running extremely fast, like, busting through the brush, scared me to death because, like, I'm at least a half mile in the woods by myself at this point. I was probably 11, 12 years old whenever that happened. Uh, and then years later, I would hear about uh, sightings and stuff in that general area. Huh. After I became a Bigfoot researcher, it was not whenever I was like growing up there all the time. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it's pretty crazy. Um when you were a kid, you had like no idea. That yeah, no up. clue, no clue at all. Yeah, because like th those old timers, like you know, like they did not mess around. Like no, you know, yeah. they were tough. Yeah, 
for sure. So he's gun like in the middle of the night. That's that's something. Something's going on there. Yeah, yeah, and also not getting out of the camper like that's really weird. Like, yeah, yeah, and like, yeah, exactly. But they they were like real stoic too, and they didn't like talk about their oh. feelings or. Oh, dude, my <laughs> my great great grandmother saw a Bigfoot. Really? Yeah. Uh, she, this was like, this would have had to have been late 1800s, early 1900s, whenever it happened. Okay. Yeah. Uh, her and her husband lived in the mountains of Arkansas. They had like a cabin and they had some pigs. Uh, they were raising pigs, I guess. And the story that I was told was that there was a commotion in the middle of the night, turned on the lantern, grabbed the shotgun, went outside. And as they like got out there, they saw a Bigfoot like pick up one of their pigs, like reach over the, the fence that they had built, reach over with one arm, pick up this pig under its arm and just walk off into the woods. And they didn't bother okay. shooting or anything. They just like went back inside. <laughs> like I didn't see that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and this was like, I didn't find that story out until I had been actively researching Bigfoot for like years. And like everybody in the family knew it. That's why I found out the story. My uncle told me is like, well, you know that you're, Great great grandmother saw one, right? <laughs> like, uh, no, no, I didn't. <laughs> Wild, yeah, Wild. Like, thanks for telling me. I've been out in the woods playing my entire childhood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And and that uncle was telling me that story because he was a Bigfoot researcher, and I never knew that either. Really? Yeah. He, uh, whenever I was real little, he had joined the Navy. I remember that, and uh, I knew he was stationed in Japan. Like, that's where he served his time in the Navy at. But before that, he was in, like, Washington, I guess. The Navy had a port there or something. And, uh, yeah, he got into researching Bigfoot whenever he was there and was, like, going out actively looking for them. Wow. Yeah, and I don't remember ever hearing about any of that stuff, <laughs> like – it was an interesting conversation, to say the least. It's such a it's such a fascinating. It's like, you know, it's it's good that that we're talking about it because like I I had I kind of had hesitations about coming on and probably just you know telling everybody my insane stories, but I kind of like have this philosophy of like we need to talk about this thing. So pretty much ever since this stuff started talking, I just I would talk about it with anybody like sitting around the campfire, you know, coworkers, whatever. Like, I don't care. You're going to think I'm crazy. Fine. But this is what I had. This experience that I had, and I'm not ashamed of it. And I think it's fascinating. Like it's way more interesting than anything else. People talk about It's like this subject. And so ever since all this stuff started happening, like, you know, just talk about it. And I feel like the older generation, uh, you know, it was just so much more stigma about talking about this kind of thing. You know, um, so it's good. It's good that that you're uh, doing what you do, and I certainly appreciate it. Yeah. Well, yeah, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing if it wasn't for people like you uh, willing to come on here and share their story. And I, I mean, I really do appreciate it. I've really enjoyed the conversation, and uh, I plan on having more conversations with you in the future, man. So thanks for coming on. Oh, my pleasure. My absolute pleasure, Matt. Thank you so much. And if you've had an encounter with something you can't explain, email me at bigfootcrossroads at gmail.com. If you get a chance, check out the website, bigfootcrossroads.com. You can find links to the social media, merchandise, past episodes, everything you need all in one place. And until next time, remember, there's something in the woods. Something in the woods.